Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Carmen Yetzi Mazera, and I serve as Executive Director of APSIA, the Association of Professional Schools of International Affairs, to which all of your schools and programs belong. I am delighted to welcome you to another APSIA career webinar, this time featuring the great wisdom of Emily Lett Jackson talking to you about the good work of the International Republican Institute. Emily has some slides that she's going to share with us, but in the meantime, if you have any questions or things you'd definitely like to hear about during the course of this session, feel free to put those in the chat and we'll do our best to respond to them after she's done with her presentation. We have a number of these webinars coming up over the course of the fall, so I look forward to seeing you at future APSIA events. And Emily has also kindly agreed to let us record this session and it will be available afterwards on the APSIA YouTube page. So you'll get much more information on that at the end of this session and in follow-up communications from me. But I don't wanna take up any more of your time because I'm sure we have a great conversation ahead of us. And so with that, please, may I present Emily Lett Jackson. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carmen. Um, wow, great wisdom. That was the best introduction received in 2021. I have to definitely have uh, my bio read. Uh, so welcome, everybody. My name is Emily Lett Jackson. And as Carmen said, I am the recruitment manager here at International Republican Institute. And from here on, we're going to call it, um, for short, IRI. So I've been with IRI for about, uh, actually I looked at my profile today, two years and seven months. Uh, so I will be going on three years on March 1st. I have actually been in international development and the recruiting world for recruiting, I will say, for 12, 13 years and in, specifically in international development for about eight years. So definitely have seen um, a lot from for-profits to non-profits, um, worked in the private sector also in recruiting. So I have lots of uh, answers, I hope, to questions that you may have for either space, especially during a time right now um, that we all have been navigating uh, for this pandemic, kind of COVID, social unrest, couple of years that we have all been experiencing. And I hope, um, based on you all attending, have also been able to um, pull through, at least with um, your goodwill and your strong minds intact. So uh, I think I can go ahead and share my screen and start the PowerPoint. Uh, excuse me if uh, for one reason or another, the technology does not work properly. Um, okay, so I think I can. It's actually asking me about Oh, okay. Uh, pull up my PowerPoint. All right. And please, Carmen, let me know if you can see my screen. Perfect. All right. So here we go. Um, IRI, International Republican Institute, um, which is a long name. And as you can see here, um, our core responsibility, our core duties, um, and our mission is actually to advance democracy worldwide. And we do this um, actually outside of the United States. So we are working internationally only and work in over 87 countries around the world. And we have offices in over 30 of those countries. Here is, um, small map, sorry, um, <laughs> that it's um, smaller than I would have liked, but it shows some of the locations um, all over the uh, world where we are located. And some, and all of these pictures are actually programs that we have worked in. Down at the bottom here is North Macedonia. Here at the top is Timor-Leste. And here um, at the bottom is a program in uh, South America. Some of the programs we don't say the actual name of because they are considered closed spaces um, or closing spaces, which 
um, I'm sure you all know, uh, means that there is sensitivity in that country on having a, um, a democracy and having a democratic process. Um, most of them are, um, you know, uh, part of dictatorships. So we're very sensitive about naming those countries. Here on this next slide um, is just um, a breakdown of the kind of work that we do in spreading democracy worldwide. We are, um, part of our goal is in amplifying marginalized voices. So um, it's really important for us to be able to not only work with marginalized citizens in countries um, and to help their voices be raised, but even more importantly, for those voices to be heard. Um, we also bring citizens together, and in bringing citizens together, we bring all types of um, ethnic groups, of um, you know, diverse individuals who have different perspectives, who are in different political parties. We bring them together, hopefully, um, to be able to have um, conversations about belief systems, about democratic processes, um, about giving them tools for best practices, but also to help them to see that they probably have more things in common than they have different from each other. And that people should be able to um, participate in a fair, um, and I would say not fair actually, but a transparent and equitable process that allows others to also be able to have their voice and their perspectives heard respectfully. So the other thing that we do also is ensuring that elections count. So um, as, we, as we have experienced here in the US with elections, they can be quite volatile. Um, there's lots of, um, I guess, sensitivities around elections and what we want to do in uh, the countries that we work in is make that process transparent, make that process kind of demystify what happens in an election so that all participants are able to not only um, you know, cast their vote, but also participate in, in civic education and, and civic participation. So again, giving them the tools to participate in the electoral process. And here is IRI's core values. Our core values are really the foundation of our organization. Um, obviously, we have a great mission and we know exactly what we're trying to do um, in spreading democracy worldwide. But the core values are really um, the foundation of how we go about identifying good candidates, how we go about implementing strong book programs, and also how we ensure that there's equity being practiced across the organization. And we can only doing, do this by following these core values, which are part of our programming and our people. So we have excellence, which we believe in quality results delivered by investing in people. We have freedom, where we believe in exploration and experimentation and being able to do that in a way where we can be agile and responsive to our needs. We have respect where we believe in trust, empathy, and empowering people. Teamwork where we believe in diversity, inclusion, and the power of global collaboration. I would also add to that teamwork is equity. So we do have a de and I, um, uh, I guess, uh, the philosophy and, and we have a way of making sure that diversity is, is incorporated in our recruiting. With um, transparency, we believe in open communication and clear decision-making, and that's even with our compensation. Our compensation skills are all made available um, internally with our staff so they can always see different comp levels. And accountability, we believe in personal responsibility as the foundation of our success. So um, again, these are the core values that we are always looking for in the staff that we hire. Also the core values that we are using when we are being compliant and when we are ensuring that the beneficiaries of our work really um, are able to see the importance of how we do our work, not just, you know, kind of forcing it down somebody's throat, but doing it in a way that's going to show some grace and some empathy along with these core values. 
And um, I'm actually going to stop on my core value slide. I know I've like said everything in about five minutes, <laughs> which was faster than I had hoped. So um, if there's any questions, I can ask a couple of questions based on what I've presented so far, if that's okay, Carmen. Absolutely. What would folks like to ask at this stage? Emily, I'm curious, um, you mentioned all of the different countries that IRI is working in. Yeah. Is that typically local-based staff who are supported by a DC team? Are they teams who travel regularly? How do different staff move around the globe? That is a great question. Um, and it's actually um, a mix. All of our teams in country, I would say are 90% um, employed with local national citizens of that country. So if we are in Tunisia, 95% of that staff is going to be Tunisian. So, you know, they are citizens of that country. Um, we do have, um, we do have staff who are not from the, a particular country. So they are not local national staff um, in different positions throughout our in-country um, programs. And usually it's to bring the institutional knowledge of IRI into that programming. So we usually will have staff. Um, we have a bit, our headquarters is in Washington, DC. And we are, we have about 800 employees across the organization. Half of those are located um, a little less than half, maybe, in the DC office or in the US, depending on, you know, remote and telework situations. Um, and so uh, those staff are typically um, the ones who go to the field and they work in our country offices because they do have the institutional knowledge of IRI processes. So they know procurement, they know about grants management, they understand logistics planning, um, and they are then doing capacity building and teaching our local staff, how to then take on all those processes that are needed in order to submit compliant paperwork for our funders, um, which they then send back to the Washington DC headquarters office. So it's a mix of, you know, as I said, a 400 person team um, of people in the DC headquarters office. And then the other half of that being, you know, all over the country outside of the US, which are primarily our local national um, citizens of those countries. Thank you. Matthew Teasdale, I see you have your hands up. If you feel free, you can unmute yourself or type in the chat. Um, what sort of things are you looking for most uh, in an intern who applies to the transatlantic strategy team? Oh, that's a good question. Um, an intern. We typically are looking for interns that um, first passion and interest in the work for a particular region. So, um, and this again is generally speaking, um, they either are studying a specific region um, or they have had some experience already, whether that be through an internship or through a study abroad program in a region, um, or, um, you know, maybe even they have family descent from there, from a particular country, and they have really done their homework on understanding kind of the nuances of a country. So I think it kind of starts there. Um, you know, not everybody has an opportunity to do study abroad programs in, in countries that they have an interest. Um, but I think that there's always, we're always looking for a way to take an intern's uh, skills and show that they have been, they're transferable into other types of um, either country experience or opportunities. So if you never traveled to a country or region that you're interested in, but you've done blogging about that country, or you have written a thesis or some type of um, 
senior seminar on that country. You can, you know, you can present that as part of your um, writing. And just being able to talk about, you know, that experience in a cover letter, um, you know, having parents or other, just your other family that is from a particular region and talking about your connection to that region and why it's important to you. So I'd say just overall, I think it's important for interns to be able to convey their transferable skills, their passion and their interests in a cover letter that really tells your story in a different kind of way than your resume would. Emily, we have two other questions, but I know you'll get a little bit more into the hiring process in just a minute. So, I will. So should I continue with my presentation? Yes, please. And I'll ask my colleagues who did ask their questions to hold on. We may, we may anticipate what you're going to ask. So yes, please. Okay, perfect. Thank you. So uh, next, the recruiting life cycle, which I think that's why everyone's here today. <laughs> uh, our recruiting life cycle is actually a seven stage process. So if you have ever um, submitted your resume to IRI or you have gone on an interview at IRI and you're like, oh my gosh, that happened like a month ago. Why haven't I heard back yet? Because it's seven stages. <laughs> and those seven stages include, and some of these obviously Obviously, um, you know, some of them are not connected to the process you're going to participate in, but it is just some insight into how we do our work. We first receive the recruiting request from managers, then we go to our uh, advertisement. And I would say Advertisement is really important because where we advertise, this is a question I think that you should try to find out from any company that you're interested in because you want to know where they're going to be posting their jobs outside of their their um their website but so you always have kind of the first dib of knowing where to look if something new is coming up um, and you can also ping those websites um, in your browser so that you can quickly get to them and and be pinged when new opportunities arise from a particular co uh, company so we advertise first on um, if it is a, a PO or above so, uh, or below. So if it's a program officer, a program associate, or a internship, we post it on Handshake. If it is a PO, which is a program officer or program manager position, we post it also with Apsia. Um, if it is, um, and then we also post on Relief Web, we post on DevX, and we also post on our IRI website. So those are just a couple of the main um, locations where we are posting, and you can always um, definitely identify our opportunities. Next is our selection process, and in our selection process, it's a, it's a, kind of dual process between ourselves and the hiring managers. The hiring managers will typically go through the resumes and select those candidates, usually the top 10 that they um, have an interest in and in finding out more information about. Then the recruiting team will uh, take a look at those top 10 and we usually start by phone screening the top seven. And after we go through that phone screen process, we then give those notes to the hiring manager to let them know um, how those phone screens went. And those phone screens, the things that we are looking at is, um, you know, how did the person show up to the meeting? Were they, did they have their camera on? Did they seem engaged? What did their background look like? Was it neat? Um, was it not neat? Um, you, you know, we are not so held um, or I guess so um, um, obsessed with kind of looking at the dress, but we do want to see that you are neat, um, that you've come prepared with your resume, and that you are um, engaged in the conversation. That phone screen also um, will take a look at what kind of um, homework have you done about IRI and about the position. 
Do you know anything about who we are? Do you know where we work? Um, and why do you have an interest in the position? Or are we just one of you know, 80 other uh, applications that you have submitted? The other part of that selection process is about your diversity, equity, and inclusion thoughts. We're not looking for a right or wrong answer because um, that's not what we're here to do. I don't think anybody can tell you if your answer is right or wrong. We just want to know that you're thinking about it, and we want to know we want you to know that we IRI is thinking about it because diversity is important to us um, because we're always trying to create a safe and welcoming environment that's inclusive of different perspectives, different demographics. Um, and, and also, you know, that is, um, that is equitable for all. And when I say equitable for all, I always try to stay away from equity and fair because things are not always fair, but it is going to be equitable in a way where, um, you know, the process for how we do things are, is always going to be transparent and our policies are always going to be transparent. Um, and, and so that's really important and part of our selection process, just in you being able to answer the question, not on the answer you give to the question. So just make sure you understand those differences. Then after that phone screen, um, as I mentioned, the hiring manager will take a look at um, our um, notes and then make a decision on who um, the hiring manager would like to go to that interview process stage. And that interview process typically is then a panel interview. And that panel interview consists of um, two or three people, I should say three or four people. And it is a couple of the people from the actual team that's hiring. And then we also have um, people typically join the panel interview from across the institute. So that, um, you know, and it's usually somebody who will um, either directly or indirectly work with this candidate and has some insight on, you know, the duties and, and how these two positions intersect. After we go through um, the panel interview, then there's final interviews. And the final interview is usually with our division leadership. Um, and the division leadership, then um, at that point, there's probably only two candidates who are going to the final interview process. And the division leadership will then also ask um, questions of the candidate, but they also ask a question about also DNI. And that DNI question is around um, empathy. And, um, you know, how do you describe empathy? And when did you have to show empathy to someone? So again, this is just me giving you some information about um, you know, questions that you can pull from your personal and professional life when it comes to diversity, equity, inclusion, to be able to incorporate those in a, in a strong response, in a response to a DEI question. Then we have our verification process, and that is part of our um, uh, reference checks. So we then are at the final stages and we're checking references for our finalists and typically we'll check the references of the of the two finalists for um, an opportunity or for a position. And based on those reference checks and how well um, those go, that's how a decision is made. And then um, our hiring manager will send a hiring justification to our HR. Our HR team will use a compensation philosophy where they will look at other staff in the organization who have similar titles, similar education, and similar um, experience. And they then pull the median salary from that group of similar, can, uh, similar staff. That median salary is then how we come up with the salary range that's then extended to the candidate. And that um, candidate then decides whether they are accepting the position or not once the recruiter extends it to them. 
And then um, we go to onboarding and we, the day before a new hire starts, they actually go through an I-9 verification. They receive an onboarding schedule um, because we do lots of, we do about two or three weeks of orientation um, so that the candidate or new staff can become acclimated with who IOI is and meet with different divisions across the Institute um, in order to also understand uh, the institutional knowledge of IRI and where you can also find information. So that is our, and then the next day they start. <laughs> so that is our recruiting life cycle. Uh, next, we have our careers and internships. So um, all of the process we just talked about is what is connected to our careers and internships. Um, you know, the, I should say the recruiting life cycle is connected to the careers and internships. And these are some of the positions that we have um, that our um, that are junior level professional positions. So we have procurement coordinators who are working with procurement administrators in our um, accounting and finance group. And they will make 43,000 to about 45,000. Um, you know, that could be give or take, depending on the experience that they're coming with. Um, excuse me, we have our program associates and they are making 40,000 to 40,000. Our program associates is our most program position that is on um, that works in our divisions. And so that could be someone who's working with a program manager who is implementing um, a program in one of our countries. We have our senior research and evaluation associates and they're making uh, 43,000 to about 45,000. And they are working in our monitoring, evaluation, and learning team. They're either going to work on the um, uh, evaluation side or they're going to work on the technical side. And that is also under our Center for Global Impact. And then we have our program officers who are one level up from our program associates. And as you can see, um, the salary increases from 54,000 to 60,000. And that's because that position also increases in the um, amount of experience that you need. So a program associate um, is from zero to two years of experience where the program officer is um, you know, anywhere is usually about uh, two to three years of experience. And then we have our virtual interns and our internships are always paid and they um, are $15 and 20 cents an hour. And if you're going to also come into the office, you will receive a travel, a transportation stipend. And that's $180 a month that you would receive on a smart trip card. So that is uh, the summation of our actual opportunities. Um, I'll stop there because the next slide is kind of how to stay in touch with us, um, which is through our website, Twitter, um, and the, uh, the podcast that we have. But I will go back to this slide and hand it to Carmen to help me with uh, facilitating some questions. Thank you so much, Emily. Um, the first question that I have, uh, the first two questions are related. For these positions, are they all DC based? And do you have to be a US citizen for positions that are based in the US? So for, for positions based in the US, yes, you do have to um, be either US citizen or have a green card or have work eligibility. So um, if you have work eligibility, like an EAD card, um, then yes, you can definitely apply for any of the US-based positions. Um, unfortunately, we do not sponsor. Uh, so you would have to have some type of um, uh, um, employability in the US that's not based on being sponsored. And these positions here on this slide are all US-based positions. Um, how you can tell if a position 
is not US based on our website is one, the location in the actual position um, will say, um, you know, South Sudan or it'll say Nepal. Um, in, in, if you look at location on our website, if you're reading the job description, all, typically you will also see um, the position say where the, it's going to be located or where the position is based out of. So that's just kind of one um, kind of quick way of knowing if you're looking at the actual um, site, the IRI site, and looking at the location of the site, um, I'm sorry, of the position, that'll quickly tell you if it's US based and it'll say Washington, DC, or if it says, you know, another country, then that's usually where the position will be based in that other country. Wonderful. You mentioned for a program associate position, it's usually zero to two years experience and a program officer is, is slightly more than that. Are there educational requirements that accompany that or does education take, can education take the place of experience? Uh, education does not take the um, place of experience at IRI, but um, I would say for, unless the job description says you have to have a master's, master's degrees for most of our positions are just preferred or or quite honestly you know not mandatory um not, for the actual interns you do not need to have your degree already completed so there when you apply to an internship it will say um, completing, so completing bachelor's or completing master's. So I think um, that's, you know, one thing where it doesn't matter if you have a bachelor's or a master's or neither just yet. Um, and then in, in some of the positions, how you know if it's, if um, other education is required is that it'll actually say, you know, it'll either say preferred for a particular uh, set of, um, academic experience, uh, academic um, degree, or it may say um, um, equivalent to. So some of our positions, you don't have to have a degree and it'll say either the bachelor's degree or experience equivalent to. So um, we do have positions and I can't tell you exactly what those are because they just kind of vary based on division needs. Makes sense. Uh, it looks like my colleagues at the University of Denver Joseph Corbell School Career Center have a question. Folks that let, go ahead. Oh, you're on mute Corbell Careers. <laughs> Hello, hi, my name is Stephanie. Uh, uh, thank you for your presentation. I'm just wanting to have a question for a student that is here. He's here. Um, so if I want, if they want to work abroad, whether or not, for example, let's say Africa, and if they have no connections to Africa, will they still be qualified to apply there? Or and if so, um, will the salary differ? What? How does that pr uh, process application? Uh, sure. That's a great question. And thank you, Stephanie, for being the proxy. <laughs> of course. So typically, we hire in our um, international countries, our local national citizens from those countries for positions there. We are not at the place um, in our internship program, I'll just say that specifically, where we are sending interns from the U.S. Um, to international countries. But if you are trying to apply for a permanent um, uh, full-time position outside of the internships, then if you are not a local national citizen of a country, you we probably wouldn't even be able to hire you. And that's because even in those countries, you have to have a work visa um, to work in that country. 
So uh, our some of our staff who go to work in other countries, we actually have to go through a visa process with them so that they can get work permits and visas and all kinds of documentation that's connected to our registration in a country. So um, unless you were being hired specifically for like a, and we usually call them RP positions. So a resident program officer, resident program manager, resident program director. So those kind of senior positions to work overseas, we would not hire a procurement coordinator or senior research and evaluation associate that is that doesn't have um, the ability to work outside of the US for another country. Um, but yes, if you ever wanna know, the money will be different also. <laughs> uh, we don't, uh, our, our, I mean, and that has to do with just, you know, the local economy of the countries that we work in and how when you pay um, a salary that is um, equivalent to US dollars, you actually upset the apple cart in that country as far as their, um, as far as their currency, as far as, you know, how others, especially on our teams, because we're looking at equity, how others on the team are being paid. So that's one thing that we don't want to do also. Um, we want to pay a equitable and competitive salary for the country that you're also in that aligns with that country's local national compensation scale. Thank you for that, Emily. Um, you're welcome. Maya, you, you can unmute and ask your question, please. Thank you. Thank you guys for this session. Um, and Emily, I have two questions for you. Sure. Uh, so uh, first one is about the timing of application, uh, specifically with the first, um, I guess, three stages of application. Um, after advertisement, how long do you take to start reviewing those applications? And then, or the how long does the selection process last? So. It, I'm wondering, um, I guess, if, if I apply and then I don't hear back for like three weeks, can I automatically assume that it's over or how long does that last? And then the second question, the salary. So um, I've noticed that your applications tend to ask like what's our um, expected um, salary. So if you see that a person is indicating an amount that's above or below your uh, median ranges that you just showed us, what does that mean for your where the, uh, can, can a person say a wrong amount that can disqualify the person from the application um and then I guess a third question is my background okay like if if I show up <laughs> I have never thought about that part <laughs> so I love Paris uh, <laughs> yes I think that definitely I think that your background is more than appropriate so I and let me be clear about that when I talk about either it being appropriate or not appropriate. Uh, you know, we're talking about, we're talking about neatness of a location. We're not always talking about, you know, obviously maybe some posters are not appropriate. Um, maybe, you know, um, uh, you know, being in a location where you're interviewing and like lots of people are walking back and forth or there's lots of loud music because you're in a cafe. We're talking about things along those lines. Um, I, I really don't want to have people, you know, um, have, have people so nervous about being able to show their authentic self that they then are trying to like change things because they wanna make sure their interviewer doesn't judge them. Because at the end of the day, you know, it shouldn't be about an interviewer judging you because you had the wrong picture up. If anything, they should be judging you on the quality and content of your skills, those skills being transferable and the passion and energy that you're going to be to the workplace and your ability to learn new skills once you're here. So um, I appreciate that question, but, you know, 
as long as it's neat and um, you don't have like your bed, your bed's in the background, but it's like all messy. And then there's clothes on top of the bed. And then there's like, you know, your your towel and your washcloth or like, or even like piles of papers on your desk. Like you can have piles of papers all around you and, and, the, and your interviewer is going to be like, oh, wow, um, they're quite organized. <laughs> So it's like those kinds of things, but don't ever let, um, you know, someone judge you because, you know, I don't know, they don't, they don't like Lizzo and you have a Lizzo picture like right beside you or something. And I'm just like taking it to the extreme, but I'm actually being honest because you also want to go into a work environment, being your authentic self. You don't want to have pretended to be something else. And now you have to change who you are to now go into this new environment. And if that's what you have to do, it might not be the environment for you. Um, so with your other questions, how long the process takes? Wow, um, that that is like the million dollar question that I always receive. The process takes as long as our hiring managers have as far as availability to either one go through resumes but also to um put you know identify you know not just identify but have four people available at the same time to then go through panel interviews um, and then three sometimes it's need sometimes we will post positions based on knowing we have a need coming up and um, it is for a grant that we actually haven't been funded for, but the grant is due to be online in like four months. So the hiring manager might go slower in their process because they have time. That's not always what we advocate in on the recruitment team, but it is sometimes some of the reason why, you know, the process may take longer than others. Um, and and, and I, I don't, I'm sorry, I don't have like a clear time frame on what that should look like. I mean, in total, we'd like our process not to take longer than two months, but realistically, we do have positions that have taken longer than that. And it's not because we lack candidates, but it's just about, you know, we may have a hiring manager that is on constant travel and they're now looking for somebody to kind of take, be the proxy for them to, to, to make a hiring decision. So there's just some nuances we can't control, but we do try to, um, and we're getting better at it, send emails to candidates to say, you know, it, 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 we're trying to do 30 and 60 days and sometimes that fluctuates and the um, time frame of when we send it, but let's just say, you know, um, after 40 days, we still have candidates that are waiting for interviews. We have an actual template that we'll send and say, thank you for submitting your resume and for your patience and waiting um, to hear back from us. We're still going through our recruitment process, um, but basically we haven't forgotten about you. So um, hopefully, for this fall, our goal, and my team is um, increasing. So with the team um, growing, we also have more bandwidth to be able to send those kinds of emails through our system when people are waiting um, to hear feedback. And I think that was all your questions, right? Uh, you said salary, above or below. If you put the wrong, not wrong, but if you put your expected salary. So expected salary is tricky. Because um, I, I want to make 150, but is that job going to pay me 150? Probably not. And I think this is also about the research. You should research, all of you should be researching um, what does a nonprofit in the democracy, governance, and research space pay a program associate? that has zero to two years of experience. And you will actually see a real range. Um, it may say 40 to 50. So you're probably safe saying, I wanna make 45, I wanna make 50. Um, it, it might say 38 to 45. 
you're probably safe putting 40 or 45, you know, but if you put 75 and you've done the research and it says clearly it's only going to pay up to 50, then you may be um, eliminated from the hiring a selection process because our goal is also to identify people who, you know, we don't have to, we don't have to uh, upset them with what our salary for position is going to be. And if you need to make 75, like, I understand that. We understand that. But you will need you won't be able to make that in this role. So and 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 quite honestly, time is of the essence. So we don't have a lot of time to identify candidates who really are overqualified or are um, asking their salary reaches out of their salary expectation is out of our reach to be able to bring on you know permanently for a position. Thank you so much for that good advice, Emily. That's always a, such a tricky question to answer in, in a, an application. I'm curious, you've mentioned in terms of skill sets, you've mentioned monitoring and evaluation, logistics, yes. procurement, grant management, and capacity building, yes. as well as regional knowledge. Are there other key skills that you are looking for that students should build or things that students should definitely highlight and draw out if they already have them? Uh, so for most of our positions, I would say at the program off, program associate, program officer, um, our research positions, you know, and and even our program management positions, we typically would love to see people who have at least some type of you know um, budgeting understanding. Whether you took that in a class or you actually have the um, you know actual practical um, experience with, with working on budgets, creating budgets or tracking budgets. Um, you know, the whole program management piece is connected to also good communication. So, you know, people who are strong communicators verbally, but also written is something that we really look for. And um, I would say, you know, someone who shows that they adaptable and that they are resilient. So maybe you've been online for, you know, 19 months working virtually through school um, and you also held a part-time job and you also, you know, took care of a dependent or a parent or a grandmother. We want to hear your story and we're looking to find different types of experiences that you can write about in your cover letter that articulates that story in a way that's gonna give us some insight to who you are as a person, but also your ability to bounce back, your ability to um, kind of change courses when um, priorities change, and your, your, your ability to, um, to be uh, nimble you know, and, and to be, um, I would say, teamwork oriented. It, everybody wants to work autonomously, you know, everybody, um, it, and I won't say everybody, but it, it's great when you can take a project and run with it and do it on your own. But, you know, what are your conflict resolution skills like when you have to work with people who have different personalities than you or who have different ways of working than you um, or, you know, are not as considerate as you might be. So we're looking for those kinds of examples and cover letters that'll give us some insight to some of those kind of um, kind of core skill sets that are, you know, more tangible that um, or an intangible that um, you might not just see in a resume. You know, we try to say, you know, hire the person, not the paper. That's wonderful. Everyone, we've got five more minutes. Um, and otherwise you have to just keep listening to me talk and really no one wants that. Um, I am curious about this advice to include some of those personal elements like caring for a dependent or caring for a family member. We talked about the different kinds of organizations that you've worked in. 
Do you think it's IRI that values that level of personal information in a cover letter, or would you recommend that for students in lots of different kinds of roles? I think in lots of different kinds of, uh, in, in, in any kind of role where you want to showcase who you are, you want your cover letter to stand out. Um, and I'm not just saying, you know, it, we're talking about like eloquent words of how you have done these personal, um, you know, had these personal situations. And despite those personal situations, you still are achieving, you still are thriving, you still are, you know, as Beyonce says, you know, making lemon out of, is it making lemon out of lemonade? Making lemonade out of lemons, sorry. Making lemonade out of lemons. Like, you know, I think companies really want to hear that point. That's, that's the point of what I'm saying. But they want to hear it in a way that connects the dots to the job that they're advertising. So that's why I'm saying if you don't have, you know, State Department or study abroad or internships at Brookings or UN or wherever it may be, if you don't have those kinds of experiences, um, which quite honestly, you know, lots of people could have those experiences. But to show that you're a little bit different and you have some personality and there's some human to you, you can talk about other kinds of experiences and pull out transferable skills that show this is why I know how to budget because I was a cashier at the market. Or this is why I know how to um, do capacity building and teaching people um, you know, new skills because I was a tutor or I took care of my younger brother and I had to help him with all this homework because my parents were working a couple of jobs. Like people wanna hear those stories in a way that connects to the job that you say you want to um, you know, or the company that you say you want to be a part of. That's great advice. And I love how you've connected it to things that often folks think don't, don't quote unquote count um, with exactly. all of the different ways folks can draw that out. Um, we're exactly. almost at time. Sam, I'm not sure if there are sample cover letters, but I'm sure your career office at Maxwell will have those good examples to show you of what a quality cover letter looks like. But I think um, from what Emily said, it's really about taking what an, an organization is asking for and making it very clear how you can deliver on those different pieces and things. Um, and so with that, I absolutely wanna thank all of you for being a part of this conversation. And Emily, thank you for this wonderful advice and walking us through the, the recruitment process at IRI and all of the good work that you're doing. To my colleagues uh, on the recording, we should have the recording for this session up on our YouTube page, which I just put in the chat hopefully within the hour, technology permitting, and it will join all of the other recordings of webinars that we have from the past. And I look forward to seeing all of you at future APSI events, and those recordings should also live up there as well. So thanks to all of you for being here. And Emily, thank you so much for all of this great advice. I'm sure we'll fill your, your application process with many great APSI grads going forward. So thanks, everyone. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you to uh, Carmen for this great forum, this great platform. I really appreciate you even thinking of me and thinking of IRI. And if you're looking for a job, um, not only do we have jobs, but it's a really great culture and environment to grow and groom your skills. So I really look forward to hearing from at least half of y'all. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thanks everyone, take care. Take care.